my case is of a 30 year old male unmarried resident of kolkata graduate professional belonging to middle class family informant self history is reliable he is a known case of live related video compatible renal allogram procedure surgery which was done on 25th april 2023 and he was evaluated on day 10 of surgery history of present illness with no previous history of comorbidities his history dates back to 2015 when he noticed passage of red colored urine for a day which was not associated with any burning menstruation any fever any pain in the abdomen any low limb swelling it resolved on its own and he did not get it evaluated in 2018 he had another similar episode and he was treated on the lines of uti after consulting a local physician with a short course of oral antibiotics he was advised for evaluation for which he did not get done this episode also resolved after two, two days now he presented in january 2023 with sudden onset of breathlessness of two days duration it was progressive initially exertional but later even on rest and aggravated on lying down it was not associated with any cough expectoration fever sore throat wheeze there was no associated history of palpitations sweating or any chest pain there was no history of swelling in the feet or any generalized body swelling he did not notice any decrease in the urine output there was no history of any froth or any passage of red or cola colored urine there was no history of any seasonal allergy or any such previous similar episode he remembers that he was told that his blood pressure recording at that time was elevated around 190 by 100 and he was admitted under cardiology for further evaluation blood pressure was controlled with oral and iv medication and he became symptomatically better his cardiology workup was essentially negative but he was told that he had a low hemoglobin of 9 mg per deciliter 9 gram per deciliter and increased creatinine of 6 mg per deciliter and his urine routine examination was showing protein and blood levels nephrology consult was taken and he was counseled for the need of a kidney biopsy which was done and which showed advanced renal disease to the tune of 40 to 50% He was explained about the irreversible nature of his renal disease and the options of renal transplant and hemodialysis were explained to him. He was initiated on hemodialysis via a right temporary IgG HD catheter and discharged on twice weekly hemodialysis after right contact insertion. He continued hemodialysis in his hometown. His urine output remained in the range of 500 to 600 ml per day. His weight gain between sessions was 1 to 1.5 kg according to him. He had no fever, no cramps, no access related issue or any hypotension episodes during his dialysis sessions. He was administered in injection erythropoietin after each session. On his follow up to our hospital in March 2023, his blood pressure was fairly controlled on three medications. His hemoglobin had improved to 10.5 and the family was willing to initiate the transplant process. His father volunteered to be the donor. His blood group was O negative. and after obtaining the necessary workup and clearances they proceeded he was started on two immunosuppressants two days prior to transplant which he tolerated well he said he received an expensive medication on the day of surgery prior to his op on 25th april 2023 he had an uneventful surgery with satisfactory urine output and stable vitals but mild pain at the site of operation which was managed with iv medication his immunosuppression was continued and another dose of the same expensive medication was given after 2 days of the operation his drug levels were monitored and doses were administered his drain and his folies were removed on day 4 and day 5 respectively he was having a fairly smooth course when he was informed that his creatinine levels had started increasing from day 6 onwards he had no history of any fever pain at the graft site no history of any burning menstruation no passage of red urine no history of increase in blood pressure or decrease in urine output he was evaluated his urine routine culture renal doppler showed no abnormality and his graft biopsy was done the next day which was provisionally reported as rejection and he was given three injections of steroids for three consecutive days his creatinine levels started decreasing currently he is being monitored and passing adequate urine with no other fresh complaints so to sum up any one of you would like to sum it up that shows how 
attentive you were when she was presenting? Anyone volunteer? In 2018, March, uh, it was in session of hypertension at ES. This was a higher site, but we did not have any linkage during outdoor hospital meeting. No, college, sir. Hypertensive, uh, you think? That's because I know we went to the cardiologist first. Well, and then the lady said, No, what are you trying to say by then? You know that from January he is on dialysis. So, where's the doubt that un unevaluated renal disease who reached uh, CKD5 had to be initiated on dialysis and only then did you advise on a transplant, isn't it? So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, more and more of you should remain aware that a hypertensive patient lands up in a cardiology clinic rather than in a nephrology clinic. Because remember that kidney is both the culprit as well as the victim in hypertension. <coughs> so it should be very clear who should be the primary evaluator. I am not saying this just because I am a nephrologist and you are a nephrologist. But you know the general trend. So very slowly, I hope you are aware of uh, Bright's uh, this thing, you know. Diseases. <coughs> hypertension is a syndrome by itself in nephrology. Okay, yeah, so fine. So he had reached CKD5, <coughs> an unevaluated patient. And he was, his biopsy showed the same, and he was advised transplant. He was transplanted. Sixth post transplant base, he's already told you. Elevated creatinine. Within 24 hours, the biopsy found to have, yeah, evidence of rejection. So he was told, he is giving the history. And given three injections, then fine. And then, so that is in. You sort the and after the so called treatment, she says he is already improving, the creatinine is coming down, and he is under observation. Is that right? Okay. So, would you like to speculate with your history? What are the primary ills from 2015 onwards, considering he is a 30 year old Indian and this Milu? So on and so forth, and it's taken all of eight years. So, IG and nephropathy would commonly, I mean, you know, occur to a, a practicing nephrologist in India. Uh, he didn't produce his uh, biopsy of the transplant? No, the, of the native kidney? Yes. So, what I'm trying to say by that is. A 30 year old educated guy, if you would asked him, he would have also told you. What did he say? It was just that it is advanced end stage kidney disease. He actually mentioned that was IG. Exactly. So actually, I have written my summary. Exactly. Yeah. What else could it have been that has taken 8 years to reach there? So, it could have been Alpert's reached, reached end stage kidney disease by. You use a mic so that they can all hear you. Yes. Yes. Sir, uh, second possibility could be Alpert's, but there is no family history. He's reaching ASR, 30 years of age, he has But then he has no other symptoms, he has no other, uh, any, uh, any deafness, any eye symptoms. Okay. What else? Presenting with active hematuria which subsides, you know, some general treatment. What else could it be? PSG. PSG, PSG. but then it does not present like recurrent hematuria. So, a PSGN or a post infectious, some kind of a verlo nephritis, because unlike children, adults, and a 30 year old, even 7 8 years ago, would have been an adult, consider him to, uh, I mean, you know, if it had to happen, it can go back. Okay. Uh, how many of you would think of a renal limited vasculitis? Well, you know no other features. But there are entities called renal limited vasculitis. You know, not investigated at all. So
So here's where if you were the treating nephrology, you would love to see his native kidney biopsy. For two reasons. You are advising him on transplant. You must, you must know what are his primary disease to the extent possible. It may be evident, it may not be evident. Because end stage renal disease is all thyroidized kidney, and eh? that part is true. And she took care to explain to you that there was no frothing of urine and no this and no that. You know? Okay, secondly, you know, there used to be a belief when IgA was first described that IgA and hypertension don't go together. That is not true. And your latest text, including Oxford textbook of nephrology and even Jenner, now say quite a number have significant hypertension, and you heard that he also. Okay. History, you know, good person. So, what are the other causes of uh, unexplained renal failure in young patients? So, you said alcohol, you said hygiene, and hypertension. What are the other causes that you can consider? Mm -hmm. For young patients, uh, Frank hematuria subsides on its own or with very general treatment. MPG, but they depend on the rent of the state and the country. Just the hypertension and uh, renal dysfunction. What are the other things? One day by added PIGN, I mean, force infectious. Hmm. Right. Thrombotic microangiopathy. It's those languages. When there was a solitary episode, we could consider a DD of thrombotic microangiopathy. But it won't happen that subsides after three years again later, then waits another five years, and then in your presence. So that would be a little odd. Other, uh, um, there are certain uh, these familiar hematuria, like M. Bychine related, um, they also present as recurrent, I think, uh, microscopic hematuria, like Techner and all. They are variants of average. So you are stuck to hematuria only. Let's say forget hematuria. What are the causes of hypertension, lipidemia? How do you divide the hypertension? Because jumping to alcohol, how much common? How common is hematuria macroscopic in alcohol? So uh, more, it is uh, intermittent microscopic is more common. So but in the first two decades, there could be episodes of but not that common. So whenever you are looking at a young person hypertension, what are the things that you come to? Lupus. Okay. Yeah. Lupus, lupus can be a possibility. That is mm -hmm. connected to the lupus or else. Vasculitis. 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 Some things that should come in, say, VUR, vesicular remains, mm -hmm. you should come. That is something you should come. Renal dysmosis, cataiasis, those can be one of the things that you should come to. So those are Differential should be in your mind when you are evaluating a young person with hypertension and renal dysfunction. A lot of time you have chronic congestion and arthritis. I don't think they can hear you very well in the back. So maybe you can use this. Because right now we are only addressing her, but they all must listen to what you are saying. So. You have not palpated this guy. He gets episodic hematuria. History we are on. But you have to also keep the back of your mind is 30 years ago. What else? Yeah. So you would seek a very detailed family history. Typically, towards the end, by the time they reach ESRD or required dialysis, Hypertension is well known. Initially, well known. Also, interestingly, for a long time they are not anemic. PKD. If you know where erythropoietin comes from, then you will understand why. But by the time they reach total end stage and dialysis dependency, you will, that would happen. So that's another thing that kept in mind. But this is we are talking only in terms of history. So idea is to run through a lot of uh, differentials 
and then try and narrow them down based on what history has still on history. Right? Or anybody wants to ask her any clarification, that also should be on. Want to specifically ask her any question? His native biopsy was right there. Mm -hmm. Huh, so if you've seen that biopsy yeah, report, yes, it was just very briefly describe to them how you can, like I said, end stage renal disease looks the same everywhere. So you still have somebody reporting this as an IgA that has reached this stage. So you probably should make a mention of what the immunofluorescence showed in that native kidney biopsy. It'd be a good idea. <coughs> and remember, a fair number of diseases of which IgA is very prominent tend to recur in transplant kidney. So you must at all times know what was the native kidney disease. Sir, uh, I had four uh, had six uh, glomeruli. Uh, it was uh, three plus granular staining positive in the mesangium for IgA, uh, negative for IgM, 2 plus granular staining for C3, uh, 2 plus for uh, kappa and 1 plus for lambda. So, do you want to say it again? Yeah. So, that explains it. Yeah, good. Alright. Uh, but uh, brave that the biopsy was done at the time and he has already reached a dialysis dependency. So I presume that the renal sizes were reasonable to allow a biopsy. Otherwise, you must also know when should you not biopsy a person who is near end stage. Okay. These days biopsies have become much safer because they are all guided biopsies. Uh, nobody does blind biopsies, but fear me. Your textbooks at least mention when you need not biopsy a person. Yeah, all right. Uh, any other questions to her? All right, then clinical examination. Oh, so past history. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, So okay. past history, there's no history of any chronic illnesses, no history of any hospitalizations, blood transfusions, or any surgical history. Family history, no significant family history. He, had, uh, he uh, was accompanied by his parents and a sibling. Uh, no uh, significant history as such. Um, personal history, mixed diet, normal pattern, normal bowel bladder habits, no additions. So to summarize, uh, this was a 30 year old male with episodic gross hematuria who presented as hypertensive emergency with advanced azotemia and initiated on intermittent hemodialysis with renal biopsy suggestive of IgN. He underwent live donor related amniocompatible renal transplant surgery on 25th April 2023 with evidence of acute, uh, acute rejection in the first week post-operatively Treated with steroids and currently stable with declining creatinine levels. All exam. So, since you made that statement, can you classify the various kinds of rejection? Mm -hmm. so it is nice to go through that now, mm -hmm. so that we can know. So, we have hyperacute rejection, then we have delayed hyperacute or accelerated rejection, then we have acute, chronic, and mixed. So, hyperacute rejection is the one that takes place on the table itself and it is usually because of preformed DSAs, high titers of preformed DSA. So, it is seen when the kidney on reperfusion turns mottled and cyanotic. So, it usually warrants a nephrectomy. Uh, then there is delayed uh, hyperacute or accelerated. So, this takes usually place in 3 to 5 days and uh, this is because of lower uh, titers of DSAs. So, whenever the allograft will be transplanted, the memory B cells will incite a huge memory response. And eventually that will lead to an ADM MRI picture. Then there is acute rejection. So acute rejection usually uh, takes, um, is um, the time frame is 6 months but it can extend up to a year. So acute rejection is of two types. One is T-cell mediated and one is antibody mediated. So T-cell mediated is usually uh, the characteristic of T-cell mediated rejection is that there is chronic interstitial inflammation that is characterized by infiltration of T-cells. And the second one is this tubulitis, that is disruption of the tubular basin membranes. So this is a, 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 a TCMR. Then you have ABMR, acute uh, ABMR, which is an active ABMR. So this, uh, the there are three criteria for ABMR, whatever variety it is, either it's chronic, active, chronic, and active. That you need one, you need evidence of circulating DSAs. 
Second, you need evidence of microvascular inflammation or you need evidence of tissue injury. That tissue injury could be in the form of AMA or uterine injury, any microvascular inflammation which is actually the hallmark that is glomerulitis and pedicular capillaritis. And the third is and end arthritis that is V0. So this one comes under the first category. That is your uh, evidence of acute tissue injury. The second I've already mentioned ESAs and third is that there is evidence of antibody and endothelial interaction and that is either by linear COD staining or presence of NDATs. Okay. So this is acute, then chronic goes in the same way, both TCMR and uh, ABMR and then mixed where there are features of both uh, TCMR and ABMR. Can we have ABMR without C4D staining? Yes, sir. Can we have C4D staining without ABMR? Yes, sir. Both are possible. See, this you must remember mm -hmm. at all times to come. And uh, yeah, so that by and large classifies as a thing, except that old school would tell you nearly 99% of acute rejections would happen in the first three months and certainly uncommon, the word uses uncommon, not rare, after one calendar year, uncommon. But in the 22nd year post transplant also you can have an acute rejection, uh, especially a T cell mediated rejection, it can be, <coughs> so don't shut your mind to that. So whatever has to happen, normally a very large number would happen by the end of three months. And uh, obviously, it can happen anytime because of non compliance with immunosuppression can precipitate an acute rejection anytime in the career of a transplant patient. It skips immunosuppressive medicine, irregular visit. It can happen anytime. So, this you must do. All right. Right. So, uh, you have to examine him now. Eh? You have given a provisional order. Mm -hmm. On general physical examination, he was conscious for a limited to time, place, and person. Average build, weight of 66, height of 174 centimeter, BMI of 24.9, uh, blood pressure of 130 by 18, right arm and supine, 132 by 82 in left arm supine, 140 by 88 in the lower limbs, no evidence, no postural hypertension, uh, temperature of 90 degree Fahrenheit, um, pulse rate of 82 per minute regular. Uh, volume character normal, all peripheral pulses palpable, no radio radial or no radio femoral delay, no paralytic sinusis, lymphadenopathy, edema, GDP not raised, hair, skin, nail, skeletal system normal. Uh, on perudomen, on inspection, uh, normal, normal contour, normal shape, no distension, umbilicus is inverted. There's a scar or a scar of the transplant surgery on the right iliac fossa with no oozing, no gaping. All quadrants are moving equally with respiration, no visible pulsations or stride, corneal sites and genitalia are normal. Uh, on palpation, soft, uh, soft, no local rise in temperature, no draft tenderness, no organomegaly, and no brewy or venous hum. On percussion, normal tympanitic node hurt, no shifting dullness of fluid thread, no percussion tenderness. On auscultation, bowel sounds were normal, no brewy or venous hum hurt. Uh, the rest of the examples are actually normal. CVS on inspection, precordial normal, apex feet, fifth intercostal space, 10 centimeters lateral of the external line, no pulsation visible, uh, no scars, palpation, uh, if, uh, confirmed uh, normal apical pulse, palpable in the fifth intercostal space, no thrills, no heat, no abnormal pulsations. On auscultation, normal heart sounds, no murmurs, no galagalum. Uh, on uh, respiratory system, uh, on inspection, all quadrants move satisfactorily. Yeah, so this is where now, why I said how you must submit your case for discussion, you must type to renal transplant recipient, ABO compatible with acute graft dysfunction. Now, so what I am trying to say by this, is, though she has already told you the graft for biopsy then we already said. See the timeline, 25th of April is the transplant. We are today only on the 11th of May. So one by one, talk about what other differential diagnosis come to mind for an acute graft dysfunction, which began 6th post-operative day as well. 
So, I mean, I mean, you know, one, you know, you should stand up and suggest one, and then the other, and, and she should discount all that. Already told that biopsy is fine. It's not the end all. We must discuss because it's still an acute transplant. That is a six days post transplant. So, what else? We'll start off. What else would explain an acute graft dysfunction? ATN, huh? ATN, sir. ATN. Alright. His father was a donor. He is 30. Reasonable to assume father is 55 plus. Alright. Acute tubular necrosis as a consequence of what all? That is not likely because it's a live donation and you know we have done it in the same one. Long warm ischemia. That can cause an ATM. We must alright. Then what else? See CNI toxicity on the sixth day. But anyway, all is, what else? Why something can go wrong with the anastomosis? You still not spoken of that. Because it's all acute tubular necrosis you are talking What else? Loudly. You can sit down. Biotic or microangiopathy? In what manner would that present? Usually, it has like I could be CNA in this, but like you mentioned, it could be a little slightly more later, but usually it can present by extracellular as well. See, an early TMA occurs due to calcineurin inhibitor. First exposure to calcineurin inhibitor can cause a TMA in a graph. But otherwise, other causes of thrombotic microangiopathy will occur a little later. What is there is infection infrastructure in which they need to have a file and file infection? Vascularity could be a problem. Just thrombosis. Just thrombosis. Just thrombosis. Just thrombosis. What is there? What is there? Surgical complication. Surgical complication in the early phase. Surgical complication. Where he could have bled from the anastomosis. Uh, Intraoperative hypotension can cause this. Okay. Any reasons. Right? ATN. So, ATN is one thing that you should entertain and then discount. Uh, what other causes of graft dysfunction? Sir, it is usually divided into needles. I say you must immediately do an ultrasound the day you find a creatinine is in. Why? Obstruction. Obstruction. Huh? Loudly. Say to do loud obstruction. If there is any obstructivity or Or pressure on the vessels from outside. What can cause pressure on the vessels from outside? A lymphocele, a hematoma, isn't it? So that is why you do an ultrasound. Seven, so it's halfway through and we're not. <laughs> or the thigh, or acute dysfunction ki causes. Someone mentioned UTI, so that is important. Infection is UTI. UTI in a transplant. And how common is urinary tract infection post transplant? 30%. It's far higher than that. Which is why you do something called surveillance cultures. This is why you do surveillance cultures. Believe you me, and I am saying this after transplanting for 52 years, it's far commoner than the 30% that you've read. I assure you. In any case, even if the culture came negative because the host of antibiotics are on in the acute post-transplant period, at least the urine characteristic would still tell you there's something grossly wrong because if you have full field of pus cells, what else could you do? You can have full field of RBCs for various reasons, you can have not a full, full field of pus cells. So UTI must be kept sight of. Alright? Shall we have so? 
comienzos de cuando uno de los padres de Then, and I give it to Jesus. Alright. So, good that she is. So she has gone through an ultrasound of the crowd, she has ruled out this thing and that, and then it is already a decision has been made on day 7 post run. And then we must biopsy this crowd. And the biopsy shows. Now, um, and the blood pressure and all the normal. How blood pressure is? She said there was no graft tenderness, there was no graft side pain and then What is common presentation of rejection? Well, rise in level and hypertension may be present as And graft tenderness which is not seen in detail Right, two things which were described earlier Acute rejection that is fever and graft tenderness, pain from inside as a symptom and tenderness from your side on the <coughs> is uncommon these days. You know the reason? Because of the no, modern immunosuppression does not allow those things to manifest. When you have induction regimes, she told you, two very expensive injections given and when you give a drug like say Tecrolum, the, you know, this graft pain, tenderness and fever were common when they used to use two drug immunosuppression of azathioprine and prednisone and I have seen those days also. The moment cyclosporin, that is the first calcineurin inhibitor, came in, graft pain, fever became things of the past. You saw very few uh, cases with that. And tetrolimus which theoretically is a calcineurin inhibitor, which is those who are 100 times more potent than cyclosporin, or at least the drug literature claims that. You don't see pain, fever, tenderness, local, all that. Right? Yeah. So all that was not there, she also said. So we have biopsy. Would you like to read the biopsy of this patient? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so, uh, on LM, there are seven glomps, of which uh, one glomp is globally sclerosed. All the remaining glomps are morphologically unremarkable. There is no global glycus, that is G0. No evidence of any mesendrine matrix expansion, that is NM0. No chronic glomerulopathy, that is CG0. No extra capillary proliferation. The tubular gestation compartment shows diffuse acute tubular injury of minor degree. The interstitial angle rate is around 26 to 30% of the sample cortex, that is I2. The interstitial inflammation is composed predominantly of lymphocytes and few eosinophils. There is moderate hypothyroidism, that is T2. So, no evidence of any atrophy, tubular atrophy, any interstitial fibrosis. So, CT0, CI0. Uh, then, vascular compartment shows no endothelitis, that is B0. Any transplant arteriopathy, CD0. No arteriolar hyalinosis, that is AH0. And no per uh, peritubular hypothyroidism, that is PTC0. And uh, BKV, uh, there is no evidence of any BKVN or CMI toxicity. Then on IF, there are flow of uh, four glomps, and uh, it is negative for uh, C4D, IgG, IgM, C3, C1, through Kapanab, everything. So eventually, the BAMP score is T2, I2. So that is a BAMP type 1A with mild or related, uh, related changes. Qualified pathologists have written that. Uh, who would like to just quickly enumerate the BAMP classification of the transplant perhaps? Just broad types, we are not going to go into you know this mm -hmm. and that. No, what are the okay, six so, broad types will they talk about? So, class one is. Uh, Non-specific or no injection? Normal or non-specific changes. Alright. Normal biopsy bhi to a sakti hai na. Because kisi aur wajah se graph dysfunction hoga, hum ne to biopsy karni hi hai. Right. Either normal biopsy or non-specific changes. Okay. Then? Class 2 is antibody. In one. Which one comes early? 
need to be done to manage an ABM and the success <coughs> is not a guarantee in ABM as against a TCMR, multiple episodes of TCMR get treated. Eventually they will take their toll, that is different. But multiple, you know, just to historically tell you, back in PGI days where your teacher Dr. Fuller and I were together at PGI, same batch, same year. People couldn't afford methyl prednisolone and they were given 200 milligrams of oral prednisolone the moment you suspected that it could be a disease. Okay, biopsy So it was as common as that and immunosuppression as I told you was not as advanced as it is these days. Induction was not known in 1991. We were not inducing. And so then look. So what I'm trying to tell you by that is that you must know your band well for the reason that you should be able to discuss with your reporting pathologist why does he say it is this and why does he say it is all right. Yeah. So she will classify it. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, when did bank first come in? Some people are very fond of uh, asking history of methodology. So first meeting was held in 1991, and it was first published in 1993. Good. So we actually heard Dr. Kim Soleil physically he came from Canada and presented it to us at PGI, and we heard like about bank. Banff is a small town in northern <coughs> Canada. Right. These days, meetings are not necessarily held at Banff. You know, it's been held at Pittsburgh also and so on. But pathologists do meet. Initially, just 28 of those pathologists met in 1991 and devised a scheme. So then there is uniform report. So it's a good idea for you to study Banff passages. Alright. Want to ask her any other questions on, her, on the biopsy? You heard, huh? She uh, her telling. So this is, as she said, classical 1A of TCMR, but proper TCMR. It is not suspected TCMR. It is a TCMR. So how do you treat your TCMR? Uh, so so uh, TCMR is uh, uh, basically uh, if it's suspicious. Uh, TCMR, we usually do give steroids. Me, me. You will tell us how do you treat. Uh, you may eat collective, is it? For Mac Hospital? No, you will someday have to. Right? Why I am asking you is a reason. There is a reason. Okay, huh, so usually you give steroids. How much steroids? Prior to that, you must take care to draw samples for. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Because an individual person can metabolize the drug differently. And there are therapeutic <coughs> ranges described, C0 levels are described, which you must meet, otherwise a TCMR can happen because you understand why TCMR happens. Why does TCMR happen? Usually, why not? Uh, it's a cerebral restriction, no? So, it's a non compliance to immunosuppression, which is. Uh, can be one of the reasons. 
which is non compliant or inadequate drug levels. So you must take care to obtain that, you know, that C0 sample for tetrolimus and then so so usually you give steroid. How much steroid? Uh, especially we have given fast so so pulse steroid. Yeah. 500 mg for 35 days. How much? 500 mg for 35 days. Yes. I mean, you know, if you go through textbooks of nephrology, what was initially high dose steroid, like a gram of methyl every day for three days, and if required extent, is no more practiced. Why? Because every patient has a career in steroid uh, intake. And all steroids have a cumulative effect on the patient's health. So please remember this also for all time. Whether you're treating nephrotics or whether you're treating transplants and so on. So these days, people are far more conservative. If you picked it up in time and you've seen the biopsy also. So she said, it's come yesterday only. I'm a little surprised because sixth day it happened. This is first of May. Second biopsy was done. Today is the 11th year. No transplant biopsy should take 9 days or 10 days to come, irrespective of where you have sent it. So we got the provisional report, but the final report can ah, so be <laughs> You know, and especially TCMR, can you tell us about the phone? Ke aapko, okay. Within 24 hours of your having sent it to us. Yes, sir, that's usually informed that way. So we start right. with the So. People get away with 250 to 500 milligram methylprednisolone as pulses. All right, and it is wise. I am essentially a very conservative nephrologist. So is my good friend, Dr. Dinesh Kullar, in whose treating team's head. Uh, you know, you don't have to kill flies with sledgehammers. Uh, fairly adequate to give 250 to 500 milligrams in. Three pulses if required extend. All right. Or puchhe into door. So the question comes that uh, the person had a rejection in the sex right? Now, what were the things that are assessed to prevent the rejection in the body? So, what was the assessment? Did you go through the things? Yes, yes. So the neurological work that is usually done. So uh, there are two types of antigens which can label the immune response. One is ATO, one is AB incompatibility, and one is HLA. So for HLA workup, we usually do first we do the HLA typing, and the second is we do an HLA antibody screen and then do a cross match. So for HLA typing, we uh, usually look for the mismatch between the donor and the recipient. So higher is the mismatch, higher are the chances of rejection. Um, then then we do a screen. So usually uh, these HLA, uh, HLA typing was usually done by cell, uh, serological methods initially but uh, they had a lot of false positives so we are now doing it by molecular methods like next generation sequencing. So uh, we type 3 HLA now so the second thing is now we go for the anti-HLA body screen, antibody screen. So those they are known as donor specific antibodies. So um, uh, that is done by initially that was also done by cell dependent cytotoxicity assays. So they had uh, this, uh, they used panel of cells from a donor pool, which was, they used a panel of cells which was representative of the donor pool and then that was used against the recipient serum and then after that the uh, complement was put in and the dye was put in. So if there would be an antibody in the serum that would react with the, those antigens in the donor pool cells, they, these were usually lymphocytes and then they would, uh, the antibody would come, the complement would come and the antigen antibody complex would uh, the uh, fix the complement, the complement would create a mark and cause cell rises. So that was deemed as a positive result. So, but this, uh, but this was very non-specific because we could not find out the antigen specific antigen specificities, and plus there were a lot of false positive and a lot of false negative results. So if the titers of the antibodies were low, it was not picked up. And second, if the if there was a non, uh, if there was an IgM antibody, IgM antibody which is no significance in transplant. So that was, that would also be picked up as a DSA. So that would lead to a false positive DA, DSA. So this was a cell-based assay. So now from this cell-based assay, we calculated something known as PRA, panel of reactive antibodies. So this was a this was a degree of sensitization of the recipient 
uh, to see if he would be eligible to see, uh, receive a transplant. So let's say that the panel had around 60 to 70 cells of donors. They were lymphocytes from different donors. So now if the recipient serum reacted against 45 of those cells, so that meant that the PRA would be 45 upon 60 to 100, 75%. So that means the recipient would not be able to receive a kidney from 75% in that donor pool. So this was a PRA, panel of reactive antibodies. So now we shifted from these assays, these cell, uh, these Cytotoxic, uh, the cytotoxicity dependent assays to solid phase assays. So solid phase assays include luminix or what we know as what we call as SADs, single antigen beads. So what happens is that we have uh, a concept of polystyrene beads. So they are labeled with individual HLA antigens. Okay, and then we put in the recipient serum so that will contain the antibody and that will bind to the bead. And then we put in fluorochrome tagged IgG which will bind to that antibody. So then this result will be read as a fluorescence, which is uh, expressed as medium fluorescence in density, what we know as MFI. So the single antigen beat was very specific. Why? Because we could see the antigens to which the antibodies were being elicited, and also we could take out the, uh, the uh, strength the, of the antibodies in MFIs. Then there was a modification of uh, this assay, which was C1Q assay. So now what happens is there are certain inhibitory complement factors in the serum that can prevent, they can bind to the complement and then they can bind to the anti-HLA body and then that fluorescence will not be exhibited. So then we did an anti-C1Q assay. So what we did was after the recipient serum was added, we uh, added that, uh, then we added a anti-C1Q antibody. So now the complement was fixed it, uh, and the C1Q antibody was attached to that. So that would, that DSA would be picked up. Okay. So this is your SAD. And then we have uh, uh, these cross matches. So in cross matches, there is uh, CDC, cytotoxic dependent cytotoxicity, cell dependent cytotoxicity assays. Then there is flow cytometry, and then there's a virtual cross match. So in a again the conventional principle in a uh, CDC cross matches that you take the donor uh, donor lymphocytes, you separate them into two fractions by magnetic bead isolation, P and B. And then again, you add uh, the recipient serum, it will bind, you add the complement, and then you add the dye. So you will see the lysis, so that will be CDC. So CDC cross match positive is usually a contraindication to go ahead with the transplant. Because CDC catches those anti antibodies which, which evoke a huge allergy response. What percentage of lysis would call it a positive cross match? Right. So more than 20. 20. More than 20. Good. Okay. So more than 20%. Because Many things incidentally also kill a few cells in preparation, etc. So more than 20 Right, okay. So CDC. What other method of cross match? Flow cytometry. Good. So flow cytometry cross match. So in flow cytometry, what we do is we take the donor cells. We do not need to separate them into individual lymphocyte uh, subpopulations. We add the serum of the recipient and then we add chloro chlorochrome tagged human IgG, which will bind to the DSA. So that again will be read as a fluorescence in when the, the sample is passed in a flow, flow cytometer. So that is expressed as MFI. And then third is the virtual cross match. So virtual cross match is what we deduce what the result of an actual cross match would be when we take sample which would contain, which would be typed for the HLA antigen and then we take a sample which would have, uh, which would be screened for HLA antibody. So it's like deduction. So it would add your positive or negative, negative predictive value to the result of an actual cross match. So this is the entire paper. No. The most important from this history. History of sensitizing. And so you cannot if you keep on talking about this without talking history. <coughs> history of sensitization. So we have to ask uh, for any blood transfusions, pregnancy, any previous transplants, or any such episode which can boost the immune uh, response, like any vaccinations or a recent surgery. So the, if you ask that what is first thing. Then you start your laboratory work of pneumonia. So if you turn to laboratory work of without this, uh, I think so. Also the level of the drug, I've already made a mention. After you've taken a history for sensitization, you must establish whether your immunosuppression has reached the therapeutic levels or not. What is the therapeutic level that you desire in your unit? Of so say, say sir, of in, the, in the early post-transplant, we go from 9 to 12 NG per ml of Okay, so that is universally acceptable, 9 to 12 nanograms, okay? So that you must also establish. After all, 
But a given patient and nurse can only come and say, take these. What do you know? Right? So you must have that and then go ahead with all of the other uh, things. Uh, so what are class 1 and what are class 2? Class 1 uh, is uh, uh, class, classical, non-classical. Class, uh, classical is HLA, ABC and non-classical is EFG. And then there are class 1 light molecules like MICA, MICD. Then class 2 is uh, the classical ones are HLA, DEQ, PR. And the non-classical ones are HLA, DO and DM. Alright, so, and there's also class two. so what is the relevance of class 1 and class 2? So, class 1 usually, uh, I mean, they are the ones that invoke a more uh, ferocious aluminum response as compared to You class try two. and match the class 1, but what do you do with class 2? You try and find out whether cross match is positive. They don't have to match. Cross match should be negative. It should be described in some detail. CDC and uh, you know flow cytometric and then you know virtual path. So class one should be typed to see how good a match. And uh, since we talk in terms of HLSC is not much spoken of in them. It is there. We don't try and so HLA A B and HLA. If you need to DR of that, actually DR is the most important. So then you talk in terms of 3 hours of sex, 6 hours of sex, haploidentical. What is expected in his case? 6 hours of 12, uh, 1 hour time man is expected. Because this is a, it's a parent and a Yeah, okay. except that maternity may be a certainty, paternity is never, it has to be proved. Even mm -hmm. with that second part. I don't know if you read the recent report. Uh, there's a very interesting and peculiar condition where the child's uh, HLA does not match even the mother's. And how that happens, you heard about it? Oh, it was in the news just about four or five days ago. So, IVF, tumor, uh, beautifully said. That's what you thought. It was there. The newspapers five days ago, and it was the rage of medical world. Okay. So, in this patient, was there anything in the history to tell or why did he reject? Was there anything? He did all the tests. Uh, historically, did he receive any blood transfusions? Was there sensitizing to them? Was there an infection in the pre discontent in the stuff in the pre? Sort of pneumonia in the last three months. So that was one event. And apart from that, this uh, the three months ago was pneumonia. Take that with a pinch of salt. But remember, all acute infections upgrade immune responses. So you must with the same amount of whatever antibodies floating in it. You can get an acute rejection because all infections upgrade them. Also, she took care of us to talk about CMV and BK uh, virus. Now they, they check for that. Uh, Invite right, yeah, That's exactly what I'm saying. They can also by themselves. Apart from the fact that they are deleterious to the girls, they can also upgrade your immune response and can precipitate T cell mediated. This also needs to be remembered. Yeah. So, what was his induction? Was it ABG or the basic vaccine? So, do you see any difference between the responses and the type of induction therapy that you use? So, uh, for induction, so the protocol usually is that, according to the study also, that when we haplotype the patient, so if they are haplotype matched, then usually it's no induction. But if they're not, if they're one haplotype match or whatever, or we have greater degree of mismatches, then we see if uh, it's a high risk or a low risk patient. So a low risk patient is first transplant, live donor, no DSAs, and no HLA mismatches, or less HLA mismatches. So there we go for bacilexumab. And high risk is uh, where there is incompatible, like DSA, then uh, uh, second transplant, then certain ethnicities, 
then uh, immune compatibility and other than transition episodes. So here we will go for aging. So there have been said, uh, there have been a lot of studies also that have said that in uh, high risk ATG has been better to bacileximab. Not in ABI, but yes, in, in high risk. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in armed forces, we generally get very well matched, you know, parental donations or sibling donations. No induction. And there is a very huge school of thought that talks about if actually you've done all of your immunological workup well, low risk, first transplant, well matched, haplo identical with his father. So, isn't this a bit of a surprise that after two doses ATG, the patient rejected on sixth post operative day? So, it's a good idea to explore what all could be the possibility. But not always do you find anything. So notwithstanding, treatment is an urgent requirement. And you saw three doses and the patient's platinum is settling down well. The urine output is good and so on and so forth. Relevance is pre-transplant counseling of donor and recipient should not be left only to the transplant coordinator. The nephrologist should also interact with the donor and the recipient personally. And you should be brutally frank. After all of our care, those a one year graft and patient survival has exceeded now 95%, 97%, 98% in your own record. Yet you should not discount and you must counsel them very, very clearly. And I'm sure it is done at mass hospital. You know, it should not be left to a social worker, a transplant coordinator, and all. The nephrologist should personally interact. Okay. Yeah, I have both finished my question and it is 7.30. So you have any doubts, ask her now. Ask her, shoot questions at her. That shows how much how attentive you were. In that level, how was the tackle of this? Now, tell me. Sir, I think last was around... No, the day you have detected, you have told me that the 7th post-op day, the 6th post-op day, the rejection was done. The 7th morning, you have given it to me. No, the 6th was 14. The last day. Last day. Generally, you send in our hospital level some day two, day three, day five, day seven. Day six, so there will be two levels. Day six, I'm sorry, sir. Day seven, so after that, the two levels start. There will be two levels before the five season. So you said 14. 14 was. No, no. What I'm coming to, and you short term full of steroid, three doses. What are you going to do with this tacrolimus dosing? That dilemma will always be there in your mind. After all, it is universally agreed. No, it is not a one-off person study. That between 9 and 12, we are happy. But at 14, you could cause many things, including thrombotic microangiopathy, calcineurin inhibitor related, or you could cause direct toxicity to tubular cells. Whenever your levels are high. And remember, steroids are pan-immunosuppressant. Means if you see where all which immunosuppressive drug acts at what level, you would see and absolutely at the base, at all levels, steroids act. It is just that they are non specific, but they are pan immunosuppressant. Otherwise, mycophenolic acid acts at a particular place, and uh, everolimus or serolimus acts at another particular place, mTOR, or uh, calcineurin inhibitor acts. Particular place in the immunological site. That chart, of course, should be imprinted <coughs> on your mind so that if you are throwing questions about it, you should be able to answer. Right? This is the best time to know that. After we become a practicing nephrologist, you just read. You have very little time to again rejig this. So you must know 
ایمنوال می آفرند فانتیشن کرد That's why you are going to be pissed Any other questions for us? Good, so the theory is sound, you know, since you are a good virtual class man In your hospital, how do you do the HLA typing? So, NGF, actually I don't know if it's NGF. Huh? Next generation people say that. Initially, it was like serology for my health, but in the last few years, it's just the cancer. Where is it then? It's in the house. In the house, very good. Very good. So, homework for you, how you Google, I don't care, but what are the conditions under which a mother's genetic makeup is entirely different from the child, you find out. I mean, very interesting. Alright? And, like I said, if you Google around five or six day old report ever, it's been published now in Nature also. The rage of medical world. The days of, as you said, IVF treatments. Something very interesting can happen. All right. Shall I say? Of course, Krishna. Briefly, can we tell about uh, how does the T cell division start? No, no, how does it all start? T cell mediated results. So, the first thing is that color recognition, the donor antigen, when there is a lateral variation, the donor antigens, they will travel to the secondary lymphoid organs and there they will meet the nine receptor lymphocytes, recipient lymphocytes. How do they identify? So, by the HLA type. No, no. I mean, you know, boom, how do they say? Direct. Pellet. किसी ने कुछ करना होता। Excellent answer, APC, antigen presenting cell. You must talk about genetic or antigen presenting cell. वो उसको जाके पेश करेगा तभी लिम्फोसाइट जागेंगे। ये पूछ रहे हैं, ये सारा प्रोसेस आज आप बता रहे हो। Methods by which this stabilization takes place? So there is direct, there is indirect, and then there is semi-direct. So direct is the recipient's T cells with the donor APCs. So donor, that is allogenic MFCs. Donor APCs along with the MFC and the peptide pair. And the messenger APCs. Then sir, indirect would be recipient T cells with receive. So what do these messenger APCs present? Which class of antigens? Sir, they will, the T lymphocytes, class, Class one to whatever that would be. TD four, TD four platelets. Class class one. One is eight. One is eight and two is four. One is eight and two is four. So over here. Your APCs, these are passenger lymphocytes, right? So passenger antigen presenting cells, which are in the kidney. So these are the cells which are presenting their own HLA class 1 antigens over there, right? So the question why the rejection surface the first three months or more at least are because these are directly presenting those antigens and if you have allo-reactive cells in your immune system, they'll go, recognize them, they get a help out over there and that's how the rejection takes place. Due time over a few months, they will get depleted. So then, those acute rejections go away. Right? So this rejection that you are talking about occurring in the first week is most likely because of this. Right? And uh, what is the indirect method of recognition? So indirect would be the recipient T cells with uh, recipient. Uh, it is always the recipient T. Recipient T cell with the recipient MFC. Let's also not see just recipient T cell. Recipients allo-reactive T cell formation. Recipients allo-reactive T cells with recipient cell MFC. 
self ethicism self ethicism now this self ethicism uh, how do they present the sense how how does the ethicism present the antigens mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah two types oh, okay first what is someone else tell mm-hmm. what is class 1 and what is class 2 what is what are the msc class 1 and which antigens do msc class 1 present And what are the MSc class two and which antigens do the MSc class two present? Actually, A, B, C. T four D that is a class A, B, one direct cell. Uh, class one is T four uh, T uh, T D A cell, where uh, uh, um, which which is for uh, uh, endogenous antigens. Class one antigens are present on all cells, right? Mm-hmm. right? So they present the endogenous antigens who are there. Right? And uh, if there is some viral or something. But it is mainly the antigens. While ATCs will envelop the thing with process, and those are present in us. That's how they behave, right? So that is the basic thing in class one. So initial these reactions are because of class one. That's why you are compatible with class one A, B, C. These are the main important things. And in long term, it is the DR to make it compatible with these of these. So it's more of class two and. They will be more strong rejections of that. So, if your class two mismatch is there, your kidney will not survive very long. Right? You may survive the initial part. And semi-direct pathways. So, semi-direct pathways. There is a phenomenon called as cross-dressing, which is in the market in this. So, the donor ABCs will transfer their uh, MNC along with the peptide onto the recipient ABC. So now we have the recipient allergic actor B cell, the recipient ABC, but with the allergenic MNC and the antigen. One cell can now present both the antigen okay, and stimulate that. So that is so which is the bridge between these two rejections. Uh, so in this case, what are the most likely? It was the class one yes, antigen. Mm-hmm. So we look at whether the class one antigen is good or not. So what's the holy grail of Transplant immunology. What would you like to do? The holy grail is to have tolerance. All right. And there is phenomenal amount of research going on about that. Maybe some of you who are research oriented might land up doing that. Okay. And there are various ways they have tried to induce tolerance, including a very scary thing called do first a stem cell transplant change the constitution of the patient the recipient to that of the owner and then you know transplant whatever but uh, i hope you are aware of the perils of stem cell trans- stem cell transplant and uh, as of now not something very nice right? but that is what all nephrologists from the time you start reading nephrology During your MD, you want to someday reach there, where all these drugs won't have to be given. There will be fewer side effects. There will be a very healthy living, and uh, the person will just tolerate his allograft. So, what is the peril of stem cell transplantation? Allogenic stem, uh, stem cell transplantation. What is the peril? What are you worried about? Graft could match. That is why they require only six months of immunosuppression. After that, they get reconstituted. Whereas solid organ transplant requires lifelong immunosuppression. Right? Anything like I said in the twenty-second year also you could have an effect. So the vigil has to be continuous from your part. Thank you. I'll leave. Great. Pleasure.